ックソースもやりますね Hello again, welcome back. I hope everyone's feeling recharged. The afternoon will continue to deliver some exciting content. All the content from today will be available for you on demand within 24 to 48 hours. So don't worry if you miss something earlier. We'd like to talk about estate facilities and management leaders who are creating a safe and enabling working environment for their teams, protecting their staff's well-being, developing managers, recruiting the best talent, and helping the NHS become a more inclusive employer to fall in line with the NHS People Plan. This panel, in partnership with Sodesco Health and Care UK and I, uh, so let's welcome to the discussion Greg Austin, who is the HR Director at Sodesco Health and Care UK and I, Baylane, Apprenticeship Relationship Manager at Health Education England. We have with us Carl Magnus von Baer, Dr. Fletcher at the Institute for Manufacturing at the Department of Engineering. James Freed, a familiar face to this audience. James is Chief Digital Information Officer for Health Education England. And last but not least, we have John Ford, Senior Clinical Lecturer in Health Equity at Queen Mary University London. And don't forget, you can take part in all of this by submitting questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, marking who your question is for, if possible, as we've got five speakers this time. And as my specs back on, I can see we have got a full house so welcome to our afternoon panelists it's very lovely to see you all um james perhaps we can kick off uh with you we are living through unprecedented times in so many ways post pandemic facing cost of living crisis politically three prime ministers in one year um start us off by telling us how is the world of work changing in the nhs thank you helen um well let's we start with how's the world changing because you, you you phrased that really nicely um, I read a book recently by a guy called Joseph Friedman um, called Thank You for Being Late. And its, it's uh, strapline was um, surviving a world of uh, accelerating change. Uh, and, we, and change is accelerating all over the place. But in particular, in our um, geopolitical world, climate change and in the opportunities that digital data and technology grants us. Um, and all of these things are having a massive impact. And you mentioned the pandemic as well, which fundamentally changed things like how we operate, certainly office-based work, where many of us are now, I am right a second, working from my spare bedroom um, and have done so pretty much consistently for the last two and a half years. Um, uh, the world of work is changing completely. Back in 2019, we uh, launched a report authored by a guy called Dr. Eric Topol looking at how um, automation and artificial intelligence and other technologies were likely to change things like the skill mix in the NHS. So we've known for a long time that in all industries, digital is having an impact. But I think something that, that none of us have really got a, a good grip on is quite how big that impact is likely to be in the future or even how big it is now. You know, we see it in our day to day lives. We don't necessarily see it. And certainly we don't necessarily see all of its forces for good when we go to work. Um, the Topple Review reviewed uh, 10 different types of technology and what it, what, um, how they might be embedded over what sort of particular uh, period of time. And it also looked at the skill base that you might need in order to extract some of the value. Uh, one of the technologies they looked at was telemedicine. So this is delivery of healthcare through a computer screen, really, uh, through a phone or through a tablet or through a laptop. Um, and the evidence demonstrated back in 2019 that it would take uh, 11 years to get to about 85% prevalence in health uh, services. And then the next year we had a pandemic and we got to 85% prevalence in health services within 10 days of the launch wow. of the, the launch. Crikey, you can't call a pandemic the start of that pandemic, uh, certainly the start of lockdown. <clears throat> um, desperate times, desperate measures. The world of work in future will be people moving and changing much more rapidly and responding to that accelerated change, both opportunities and threats and risks. Pandemic's the 
best example of a threat, an existential threat, actually, to everything that, that we do and, in fact, ourselves. Um, but similarly, opportunities come along and we will have to be responding a lot quicker. Digital skills will be much more embedded into pretty much everyone's work. Um, uh, McKesson, sorry, uh, McKinsey did some work um, back in 2018, I think, uh, that estimates that, that um, across all industries, we'll see about a 55% increase in the amount of time, number of hours uh, we as a workforce spend on digital skills. That increases to, to 85% in health and care is the industry that's going to be changed the most. So um, uh, we will all be uh, working um, and iterating on the services that we provide much more rapidly. And it's those digital skills that will help us to do that. We will dig into digital skills a little later in this panel. And I know that you're fresh from your Digital Skills Academy as well. Greg, let's um, bring you into the conversation, if we may. Uh, James touched on the pandemic there. How has, how has the pandemic impacted the way the industry approaches staff well-being? And have you noticed some positives off the back of the pandemic? Hi, yeah, good afternoon. Yeah, I think it's really brought home to us that we've got to look after our people, perhaps more so than we have done before. And very much for that estates and facilities mindset, you know, our people couldn't work from home. They um, they were all required to be at work every day, going through the pandemic, supporting the clinical teams at the hospitals where we work. They were facing, you know, the full PPE, the um, all the challenges of the unknown or the uncertainty that came with it. And I think it really brought home to us that we, we needed to recognise what they were doing more. And actually, they became much more integral to the whole delivery of services on award. And I think it's really strengthened the link between the estates and facilities teams, you know, our domestics, our ward hosts, our patient dining teams, and the actual clinical teams and how they delivered services as one team at site. And that was a real noticeable difference for us in terms of that. But in terms of well-being, I, I think what we what brought home to us was the number of people who were shielding, um, who were concerned. And we managed to get every one of our shielding employees back to work um, at the time when restrictions were lifted because of the care, care we put in, the recognition we put in, we teamed up with the British British Citizen Awards uh, to sort of recognise our people for the, for the effort they'd made. And I think going that extra mile with that recognition, with implementing sort of on-site counselling, so where we couldn't get access to face-to-face -face counselling because nobody wanted to come to a hospital, the um, employee assistance providers were happy to do things online, but not in person. And little things like bringing our own on-site counsellors on available to our employees made a world of difference. And it was those little things with the thank you, with the investment in counselling, that really sort of saw a return of that investment to the point whereby we've probably booked the trend in terms of we've not seen an increase in retention, we've not seen an increase in absence, we're very much where we were pre-pandemic. And we put that down to the fact we've spent a lot more time focusing on the small things that make a difference. Oh, gosh, those small things. You're so right. Those small things do make a, a massive difference. And it's amazing how many industries don't do that. So that's music to my ears that you did do that. Um, Carl, what role can professional bodies and NHS England play in both disseminating information across the NHS and upskilling the workforce? Uh, yeah, welcome. And uh, well, hello to everyone. Um, that's a really good question. I think um, the way the NHS and especially on the estates and facilities side work at the moment, and I've been looking at that for the past three years, um, is that the NHS hospitals or the NHS trusts very much work in silos. And within those trusts, there's more silos. So there's uh, quite some isolated work going on. And estate staff have reported to me that they feel isolated in the way they're working. And if they face issues, they don't know who to turn to. And I think professional bodies can take a crucial role there um, to provide training to their members alongside the opportunity to engage with other people, colleagues or peers from other trusts in a similar, similar role or with similar responsibilities um, to connect with them and then learn about the latest lessons learned, the latest technology and engage with each other and build trust. Um, and on the other side, I think NHS England um, is playing a vital role already um, in disseminating central guidance, um, trying to have different alerts coming down to, to the different um, disciplines um, about specific issues that were faced in, in some trusts. But I think there's a role to be played in also connecting, connecting the NHS people and building that one organization rather than a fragmentation of 
hundreds of trusts and thousands of hospitals um, and thousands of estates teams building that one organization and mechanisms to have a systematic and strategic knowledge sharing among people with the same roles and, and, and similar responsibilities. Um, and I think with the move towards integrated care systems, there's, um, and the move towards more collaboration, there's definitely, that's definitely a push into the right direction. It's just about making sure that the process or the, that knowledge sharing is not down to the individual, but there's processes behind there to help the individual escape the workload and the lack of time they have for it. Um, and actually meaningfully engage with other people. I'm sure James will chip in on that in a minute, but I'm just mindful of, of hearing John's voice and also Faye's voice. It's difficult when you've got so many panellists to get around everybody. Um, John, do feel free to comment on anything that you feel relevant so far, but I was going to ask you, what is the right case mix of staff in, in primary care, do you think? Um, yeah, so primary care is facing huge challenges at the minute, um, both in terms of uh, workforce and, and workloads. Um, and we're in this really a strange position where actually the number of fully qualified GPs as an head count has been going up, but actually the number of full-time equivalents has been going down. So we've got more people working uh, part-time. Um, wow. And it means actually we've, we've got a hugely, uh, huge workforce, which is, um, uh, which is finding the workload so substantial that um, they're reducing their hours um, or they're retiring early, for example. Um, so we're, uh, the NHS England has been constantly thinking about how they uh, reshape the primary care workforce, uh, both in terms of the number of GPs, but also other um, health professionals. You know, we used to have this inverted triangle position where we had lots of GPs and then a few practice nurses and a few other staff. The idea is that we invert that triangle so we just have one or two um, key um, um, clinicians like GPs who act more like uh, consultants and then they have um, um, under them um, for example practice nurses uh, physicians assist uh, associates and physios and lots of other health professionals and operate in much more of a multidisciplinary team uh, but I'll also be interested in um, you know Carl picked up something interesting about uh, mutual support um, across uh, workforce um, and we saw some of that during the pandemic where for example hospitals which were struggling for respiratory consultants um, shared them across other trusts. Um, I haven't seen much of that uh, learning or enthusiasm for mutual support across um, NHS organisations carried forward. But uh, yeah, be interested to hear what, what other people think. Cool. Let me just bring Faye into the conversation because Faye, I've left you to last. But at our last two um, rail events that we did uh, in London and Manchester, we featured two panels of apprentices to hear how they're getting on in the industry, what attracted them to rail, how it's possible to retain them. They were both fascinating panels, went down really, really well with the audience. And you look after the apprenticeship programme. Do apprenticeship support recruitment, do you think, of the best talent? And how critical, when we're in a bit of a crisis, a skills crisis in all sorts of sectors, how crucial are the apprentices to, to our future, basically, Faye? No, no, absolutely. So as you say, um, our work programme over at Health Education England, we, we support um, not just the writing of apprenticeship qualifications, but the implementation as well. And we then support all the way through to that recruitment process as well. And it's really interesting at the moment because in terms of talent, what we found with apprenticeships in particular is it diversifies our talent pool. So we, we are reaching learners who maybe are from more diverse backgrounds, who maybe hadn't had the opportunity to engage in certain professions uh, previous. And we are, as I say, so we're diver diversifying that talent pool more than anything. And it allows us to tap into not just younger people, but people who are career changers, um, who bring with them a whole host of, of life experience that we would like to tap into as well um, across all of our professions. And I think it's really key, as you say, against that backdrop of current skill mix, um, that, that we do that and that we, we have that talent pool readily available to us. Um, so no, it's quite an exciting time. Oh, I'm sure it is. James, do you want to pick up on anything Carl said, who was talking about um, at, the, at the beginning when he was talking about what could be done at health, you know, what, what Health Education England are already doing and what he felt extra could be perhaps done. Yeah, I mean, so one of the things that Carl mentioned was around uh, 
the uh, identifying and, and describing the problem of silo working within organizations and between organizations. And um, it's a very tempting thing to do, firstly. I can understand it, particularly when you're under pressure and you need to do a thing quickly. Uh, we all do it, I think, to a degree. It's kind of a bit of a human nature thing. Um, we've also got a bit of a history, don't we, in the NHS? So there was a time when, when as healthcare providers, we were almost set up in competition with one another. And that, that sort of culture does not, well, it, it leaves a legacy of mistrust, unfortunately. I think we're breaking that down now. I think the integrated care systems approach actually is making a, a sensible inroad uh, into having discussions about a population's health, um, regardless of organisational boundary. But um, I've been thinking quite a lot about um, how you might describe or record maturity of an organisation. I was going to say digital maturity, but really what I mean is sort of a future readiness. You know, it, in this world of uh, um, accelerating change, what are the hallmarks of an organization that's likely to thrive as opposed to an organization that's likely to, to not succeed? Um, and it's things like, and I, I base this on uh, some research that we did with digital professionals back in 2017. And um, what they said was, we need an environment where um, it's okay to fail. Uh, so we're not asked to spin things that aren't working. We can just stop them and you know use taxpayers' money more effectively that we that um, sharing uh, good practice and also what fails with others is actively encouraged that within organizations there's an environment that enables us to thrive and share information but also to fail fast um, that uh, we encompass the sorry we embrace the concept of experimentation so you can test something out safely but then you can have the sort of the freedom to try out lots of different things and only pick the things that are, that are giving it giving us the, the best impact on our uh, quadruple aim, uh, patient outcomes, um, satisfaction, uh, population health, etc. Um, and those are absolutely the hallmarks of a good digital organization as well. So we've, we've um, we created a uh, product. Um, in collaboration with NHS providers called Digital Boards. In fact, anyone can have a look at it. It's all completely open. If you just Google NHS providers, digital boards, there are a number of leadership guides in there. You can also at the moment sign up your boards or your boards can sign up themselves, I should say, to uh, development courses, um, which enables them to articulate, you know, even, you know, what does digital mean? How do we create an environment that enables us to extract more value from these opportunities as quickly as possible? So I think there are things we can do. I think the other thing is really important mention um is what the role of the center or an organization like health education england isn't yes and in the past central bodies have been very dictatorial and very thou shalt you know we have used heavy um mechanisms of influence um carrots and sticks um usually you won't get some money or you will only get some money if you do what we say uh, and that has not worked with us particularly when it comes to learning you know, adults actually and children don't like it when you tell them that they don't know something, but they are very up for learning when they come to it themselves. So I think there is something that there are things we can do, but there are also things we, we shouldn't do. Sounds like you've got a book in you there, James. I was interview interviewing somebody from my podcast about the different generations and everything you've just said there resonates with Gen Y when you're talking about how to retain Gen Y and what they want. Carl's been making notes. I'm going to come to you in a second, Carl, but I'm just going to go to Greg in the meantime. Greg, you know, recruitment across the whole at NHS and in all sorts of different sectors is a real challenge, trying to get the right people in the right role. What can, what else can we do to try and do that? And are we in danger as a sector of losing good people to other sectors? Yeah, recruitment's really tough at the moment. Um, you know, we're seeing other organisations, in particular distribution organisations, offering two, three, four, five pounds an hour more than, than we're paying our estates and facilities teams. They're offering bonuses for sign on uh, to go and you don't even have to work there for that long, just a couple of weeks. So we've had to be more creative over the last year or so to try and change how we attract people in. Uh, and we've made some tweaking tweaks to our structure and our, our recruitment wording and advertising and then which focus more on patient care. 
So we, we've certainly focused much more on a values-based approach for people coming in. It's about the patient care. And we've moved away from some of the older language around, you know, cleaning and um, to talk about infection prevention, to talk about the patient experience. I, and, and bizarrely, with one or two exceptions, we've seen pretty much a twofold increase in applications at a lot of our sites for our, our frontline roles by tweaking what we're asking for. And then when we bring people into interview, we're focusing around um, values and their approach. We're not, we're not, you know, we can teach you how to clean a floor, we can teach you how to serve a meal, but we can't necessarily teach the value-based approach. I, and I think we've become much more selective in who we're bringing in, um, but also it's, it, it's also keeping hold of people. And we're finding that that approach means we're retaining a lot more people than we probably did two or three years ago as well coming in. And where we have lost people to um, other organisations paying more, we're actually seeing about 30% of us coming back to us saying, oh, yeah, we've, gone, we've, gone for, we've gone for more money, but actually we don't like it. We, we're coming back because the environment and that sense of purpose and the value we're bringing is actually more important to us in a, in a working environment. Yeah. And, that, and in the current climate where we know that cost of living is a huge challenge for people, um, it's really refreshing to see people viewing it in that way. Yeah, and also career development. I think that's what a lot of the younger workers want as well. They want to see a path. I'm sure Faye will be able to add to that in a second. Carl, you've been writing away furiously, and we were talking about there with James about sharing knowledge and, and best practice among states teams and, and how that best can be done. Do you want to pick up on, on, on what James was saying there? Yeah, thank you very much, Helen. Yeah, what, what James has been saying very much resonated with the early findings of, of my research as well. As, as he kind of mentioned, the, the future readiness of, of hospitals, I've been looking at or doing case studies with different hospitals, looking at how they communicate, collaborate with other hospitals. And there's very much a diversity of future readiness in hospitals. So there's, there's pockets of knowledge sharing and collaboration in the NHS that is working very well. And there's very, very isolated parts, very disjunct parts, fragmented parts, um, which don't have the processes or the culture. And a lot of that culture is about leadership and how the leaders enable an open communication uh, culture. So a lot of the operational staff that I talk to say they, they don't feel like they can take the time um, to share knowledge with others. It's not that they wouldn't necessarily have it, but the culture just doesn't allow it. And also a lot of them feel afraid to say, well, we've had a near miss here or a failure, or I'm not quite sure about something because there's somewhat a blame culture in, in some of the uh, organizations. But also what, what Greg has said about the retention part is something that I'm seeing as well. A lot of the operational staff, they're very much aware they could be earning uh, more money in the private sector or um, yeah, some, 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 somewhere out of healthcare, but they're very much value driven and they want to work for the NHS and they, they have those value, values within themselves. And a lot of those also reported they went outside the NHS for a bit and then came back because it wasn't as fulfilling in the end. It, was, it is more stressful and that's what they all report, but in the end, um, it fulfills them a lot more. John, just going back, thinking what you were saying about um, GPs, um, I was wondering whether it's a fair spread across the country, whether it's sort of evenly balanced, you know, are they distributed equally across the country or other pockets where we're short of GPs and also thinking about socially disadvantaged areas and do you find that they struggle to recruit the staff that they need? Yeah, great question. I think this is a really important issue. You know, the, one of the founding principles of the NHS is, um, giving healthcare based on, on needs and we know that those places which have greatest needs actually have the uh, least workforce uh, particularly in, in general practice we've been monitoring the, the data for uh, for a good number of years now and we know that actually the inequality has been getting worse and worse over the past seven years um, and so at that you know if we look at it seven years ago there wasn't much difference between the poorest parts of the country and the richest but now there's about a uh, two and a half day difference uh, per average practice compared to the, 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 the richest and the poorest areas. So we know there's an inequality there um, and uh, we know it's been, get, been getting worse. And to be honest, I, I, I think we're in for a, a bit of a rough ride here unless, um, unless there's new initiatives that we can develop and test um, to try and redistribute the workforce. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Faye, just thinking about employers and what they can do to maximise the benefits of um, apprenticeships in their workforce plans, but also just also touching on from you know the contact that you have with apprentices being in this industry what do you think they're looking for and what will help retain them it's it's a, it's a really interesting point um in terms of so young people now so school leavers in particular have a have a multitude of options available to them more so than than they ever have so we are competing as the NHS in quite a crowded marketplace to be an employer of choice. We really have to we have to stand out and we have to offer something different. I thought it was really interesting what Greg and Carl were saying around obviously values based recruitment, um, because we often find that 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 drives um, what we're basically looking for, if I'm completely honest. Um, so we have to do something different because in terms of salary, especially when we look at some of our engineering roles in, in terms of estates and facilities, we, we cannot compete um, in terms of the private sector. So we have to do something different. And young people are looking for, and this is what we have reported to us all the time, they are looking for flexibility, they are looking for choice, they are looking for career progression. Um, and we can do that in the NHS. I just think sometimes we need to maybe market ourselves a little bit better in terms of what we, what we have there to offer. Uh, but if employers are looking at how they can truly embed apprenticeships into their workforce plans and really make the most of most of the opportunity, there's a whole host of resource out there. We've worked really targeted with um, NHS England recently to try and articulate the apprenticeships that exist across the states and facilities. Um, and we find that where people take that much kind of elongated long term view of their workforce, that obviously reaps benefits as well, because this apprenticeships are not the solution to everything but when combined with multiple supply routes and options we, we find that that's when we get that that maximum benefit from where employers are using them as an additional supply route on top of what they're already doing and just looking at things a little bit differently. I think it's getting into schools as well Faye I know also from from rail that you know children have no idea what rail offers and I, I think we all think of the NHS don't we if we don't work in it as doctors and nurses and hospitals and GP surgeries you, you, a lot of people I don't think realize I, I do thanks to hosting events like this realize the value of digital and digital transformation and all the exciting roles that that I think traditionally aren't perhaps um, associated with the NHS. There are some really exciting times ahead. And for those apprentices who do step in, I could imagine them being retained, as you say, not because of salary, but because, because of the work they're doing. Um, Greg, what about you know working towards diversity, inclusion, quality? How is the NHS doing? And I'm sure that's something as well that can be helped with apprenticeships as well in terms of diversity. Yeah, I think Sodexo will come at this in a in a probably slightly different way, but we we're covering a whole variety of industries, uh, and we we found that we have real leadership from the top. So our our, our group as an organisation has made commitments, and I think those commitments then flow down. So you know it's back to the old adage of if, if you write it down and put a target against it, it's going to get measured. And we're very much of a basis that we use data to understand where we are, what's our baseline, what's our aspiration. And, and we've, we've spent a lot of time in CDEX looking at what our priorities are. And we've, we've come up with sort of five work streams around DE&I to focus on, each of which has got sponsors internally. And I think it's really important that we've got real leadership. We've got accountability to drive it from the top, of, both at our group level and then into the UK and then into our healthcare division. We're very much focusing on allyship, um, on working groups, uh, on the committees, and really trying to get all our teams at our sites involved in this. It's not something that's being done to them. It's absolutely driven by getting them involved at every level of the organisation. Everyone's encouraged to sign up to the groups. Uh, and we're really finding that the whole approach to data, measurements, commitments, regular communication, we're starting to see real step change in terms of people's involvement uh, and the movement. Yeah, and working with external partners. So, so we work with an organisation called Project Search, who I think are elsewhere in the NHS. Uh, and it's amazing what we can do with them in terms of bringing young people with learning disabilities into the workplace, helping them with qualifications, helping them with work experience, and ultimately offering them jobs. Uh, and we find that our existing workplace volunteer to be mentors to these young people. Uh, and it's, it's a fundamental change in how we do things and how they look at it by seeing how they can make a difference in supporting these young people. And it, it's really quite um, heartwarming 
when we see that come into fruition and we, and we see these people get permanent jobs in the back of it. Just, um, James, hot off the heels of your Digital Skills Academy, are there any practical things that um, employers can do to prepare the workforce for the future? Uh, I would say, so one of the things that we know is that the entire workforce needs to be less afraid of the opportunities that technology provides and expose themselves to fewer risks. There, we are working on a digital skills assessment tool right now, and you can sign up to it uh, if you have a look on the Health Education England website. Um, and you can use that to measure every single member of your staff's digital literacy and help them on their individual journey to digital literacy. So that would be the one practical thing I would suggest. Carl, what is the role of trust, both among colleagues and um, employees, in their employer? Um, yeah, I think trust pl plays a very important role, um, and both among employees and of employees in the NHS or in their trust. And um, I've been looking at that for about a year, trying to speak to different people in the in the system, and and it has shown that the organize some of the organizational features and some of the legacy issues in the S NHS, such as reorganizations, um, the lack of professional development. Um, inappropriate reward systems for actually collaborating or engaging with with staff and other trusts um, have led to not only a, a lack of trust among uh, employees because that can't form if you have reorganizations and a legacy of competition i think which we mentioned earlier as well you have that legacy of trust actually competing against each other and that's still in some behaviors and in some heads and it's very difficult to get out if you want once you have that culture, it's very difficult to get out. And then establishing trust. If you don't know, are we are we following the same objective, the same common goal? Um, it's quite difficult. But if these organizational structures or um, yeah, some of the system failures um, are rectified, I think both the, the trust in be between uh, employees and of employees in the um, organization itself can be uh, improved a lot. Yeah. John, we talked there about um, you know, not being enough GPs and, and the workload and, and, and a lot of GPs going part time because of it. On the flip side, from a patient point of view, I'd just be fascinated to hear your thoughts on this. Something I've experienced, my family have experienced, friends have experienced. Our GP, GPs, to me, still feel like they're in pandemic mode, trying to get into our GPs for an appointment it's a phone call with the receptionist, then the receptionist decides whether you need a phone call with the doctor, and then you might get an appointment. What can we do to break that down? And again, as I say, it's something I've heard widespread from lots of friends, lots of family members. Can't we go back to the going to a doctor's surgery like we do the dentist? And it, it feels like the rest of the world's opened up and the surgeries don't seem to have opened up in the same way. And maybe that's because of risk of infection and worries about, you know, whether whether we're in for another tough winter COVID-wise, I'm not sure, but I'd just be fascinated to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, really, really good question. And, you know, I think it's fair to say that um, patients up and down the country are, are struggling to, to see their GP. Um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily um, the fact that um, they're frightened of the infection risk. I think they're trying to learn lessons from the pandemic. Um, there's been a huge kind of pent up of demand um, accumulating from the pandemic. GPs are also having to deal with um, waiting lists from the hospitals and managing, for example, people with um, chronic health problems waiting uh, for treatment in secondary care. Um, and so I think there is an attempt to try and um, make the, 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 the system more efficient by, for example, this triage system where they uh, try and triage people on the phone first. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's clearly not working. There's clearly um, things which need to change in terms of um, get more staff out there and trying to um, reduce the, the workload for um, GPs. Um, what can be done? Well, you know, it goes back to those kind of core fundamentals of um, improving the workforce, more more funding, and trying to divert the workload that doesn't need to be that need to be going there. And Greg, just a, a, a final thought: Is there more that estates and facilities teams can do to try and ease the burden on clinical staff? Do you think? Absolutely. And if I come back to a point that James made earlier about collaboration, you know, we're working with a couple of our, our contracts with the NHS about how we can take on some 
um, non-core clinical type activity. So fairly simple things like serving meals to the bedside, um, measuring hydration and nut nutrition takes it away from, from the nurses. And it's all under the nurses' control, but we're, we're finding that the trial that we've just done has gone down a storm with the nursing teams. It allows them to spend more time on clinical activities. And I think it's very much about how we can collaborate and partner and share best practice and find, find more ways to be creative to take some pressure off the, uh, the clinical teams in those types of environments. And just a final thought, literally final thought. I know I said that was, but James, we've just got a question that popped in and I think it kind of fits with you with perhaps digital inclusion. Um, Alan says that with regard to the point that we were talking about there with John about GPs, how do we ensure older populations, which are the growing client group for the NHS, are seen you know, by people like GPs? The older generation aren't that good at IT always, but, um, but they're being left. How do we make sure that as we move into this bright new future and we embrace digital that we're not leaving you know either people behind who don't have access to smartphones and ipads or laptops or the elderly i'm not saying that all elderly aren't digital digitally savvy because i know a lot of them are extraordinary but generally how do we make sure that we don't exclude part of the population by moving forward um, yeah. digitally? Uh, digital is just a tool set right and so it's ne it's not always the best tool to use, just like a hammer isn't always the best way mm -hmm. to to get a nail uh, or a screw into the wall. You use something else. You use a yeah, different tool. Why I've been going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, the best way of thinking of, and digital. We think of digital as just a set of tools. You know, computers or uh, our Alexas or um, I don't know. Um, uh, digital music or streaming video and you know we think of it as the tools that enable us to do to get to the outcome but actually digital is much more than that nowadays it's kind of a way of thinking it's a philosophy and at its core is this is this phrase user-centered design or human-centered design which means that you provide a service for the people who you serve and if we work in government if we work in public sector we serve everyone we serve the young and we serve the old. We serve the digitally literate and the digitally illiterate, or even just literate and illiterate. We serve people with learning disabilities. And that means that different channels, different approaches are suitable for different people. We provide one service, but we need to provide it in lots of different ways. And we need to design those services so that we encapsulate all of the people we serve. And that is what true digital thinking is, what true user-centered design is. And that is applicable regardless of whether you're delivering a digital service or not. And that is where we shall end panel four of the day. Um, thank you to all of you. Fantastic discussion. My thanks to Greg, to Faye, to Carl, Magnus, James and John, and uh, to everybody who stayed with us from the start. This is your last chance to get the most out of the event by using all the functionalities on the NHE 365 platform, whether you want to make a connection or share thoughts in the live chat. Uh, we're going to take a break now, so I'll see you back here at 10 past three.